great. Thank you, Ellison. If you have a Bible, turn to John, the Gospel of John, chapter 15. What's that? Oh, yeah, the kids. Do they want to leave, though? Let's ask them. Kids, you want to go to Children's Church? Oh, yeah, yeah, okay. You don't have to look that excited. Kids and then also the workers can make your way. I'm sorry I forgot about you. I just like you being in here. Malia, I just like you being in here. <laughs> All right, Jillian, off you go. That's good. John 15, thank you, Scott, for reminding me. Let me tell you what's coming up the next couple of weeks. I think it's going to be a lot of fun. Next week, we're, we're wrapping up the series that we started, which is the one another's. We're going to wrap that up one week early. That is going to be next week. It's encourage one another. That's the 19th. And then the 26th is going to be a few different things. And actually, we're just, uh, Jonna back here uh, is one of our young people. She's going to be playing the offertory that week. We're excited for that. And then also, um, also on the 26th, we're going to have a, um, a kind of a, a bit of a special guest. It's our oldest son, uh, Grant. I think you know that our youngest son is Ross. That's our intern this summer. Grant is finally going to make his way out here. He's 27, coming out with his wife, Michelle, and most importantly, he's coming out with his uh, seeing eye dog, uh, Nebraska. We miss Nebraska a lot. So they're going to be here on the 26th, and so we're going to have a couple chairs up here, the pulpit removed for that Sunday morning, and kind of interview him a little bit. He began losing his vision at age seven, and then was legally blind in junior high, and is uh, now currently uh, two master's degree and works with uh, special needs um, vision impaired and blind uh, students is what he does as a career. But the subject matter is how a young kid, a seven, seven years old, begins losing his vision. And then through those years growing up and junior high, what a tough time anyway. And how do you find contentment in life and fulfillment? Where is it found? Where is satisfaction in living found? And he probably is, no offense to, uh, to Ross, he's probably the deepest one in the family. Would you probably agree with that? <laughs> is he the most, most loved? Oh, definitely not. Okay. Is it the girl? Okay. You thought it was you. Okay, it is Emma. It'll always be Emma. I've been even texting her this morning. She's up early just to chat with me. So that's on the 26th. I'm really excited about that Sunday. I think it'll be very encouraging for all of us to feel limited somehow in life, waiting for something to happen to find fulfillment. You don't have to wait for something to happen. We find our fulfillment in our relationship with Jesus Christ alone. And then June 2nd, I'll just keep going through the schedule if you want. 19th, next week we finish the one another's, the 26th, the special guest with Grant. And then June 2nd, Jesse Boggs is going to be with us. He's our missionary that works down in the Appalachian Mountains, and we get to hear from him, and we're really excited about that. But this morning, it's the most repeated one another in all of the Bible. There's 58 mentions in the Bible of one another. It's things like um, bear with one another, don't judge one another, encourage one another, stir one another, honor one another, greet one another. There's actually a lot of them. There's 34 specific ones, 58 mentions. Wait, 58 mentions, but 34 different ones. So that means many of them are repeated. The one today is the most repeated one. It's repeated over and over again, and it's love one another. Fourteen or fifteen times in the New Testament does it say that, as a body to love one another. For instance, in 1 John 3, for this is the message that you heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. That's a great phrase. That which we've heard from the beginning, earlier on in the New Testament, kept saying, love one another. As you've been hearing from the beginning, and here we are at 1 John towards the end of the Bible, he says, now I'm saying it again, you need to love one another. 1 Peter, 
above all things, have fervent love for one another. For love will cover a multitude of sins. Boy, that's great. Love one another because it covers a multitude of sins. The frustrations that you have in your family, the frustrations at work, frustrations on a sports team, frustrations here that we have with one another, it's so common. That's like part of it. But how do we endure through it? It's we love one another, covers a multitude of sins. There was a survey, 8,600 people from 39 different types of denom- church denominations. So this is, this is wide. This is from Catholic to then all the Protestant, uh, from Baptist and Methodist and Lutheran and Grace Brethren and all the, all the denominations, 30, actually 39 different denominations, 8,600 people, measured their love quotient. This was the conclusion of the study. Growing churches are more loving to each other and to visitors than declining churches. Loving churches attract more people regardless of their theology. That's interesting. Regardless of how wacky some of their theology might be but they can grow. They'll attract people, and they'll be growing and reaching more people. How is that possible if it is actually regardless of theology? And it's because God is love. And those who know God know love. Those who don't love don't know God. So yet, so theology actually ends up showing itself. When we love each other, and that's probably, we've had, we were just saying to somebody this morning, we've had uh, 25 guests in, our, in and out of our house overnight from out of town since we moved into our house. And I think that's probably the number one thing they have all said when they have visited here. Am I right? They all say the same thing. That is the most loving and friendly community of people that you'll ever want to… And I'm like, I know. That That is the trait. That is the trait of a growing church. Some years back, I went to a real, I had a free weekend, so I was alone for some reason, and I was just kind of making my way, Scottsdale, Arizona. And I visited what was known to be kind of the hip church in that town. It's been there forever. And there's some pretty famous people that go there. And I was actually looking for somebody who I used to know who's on staff. Didn't call ahead. And I remember parking. There's parking attendants. There's bottles of water as you go in. There's people everywhere. I remember making my way in and then finally realizing no one has even looked at me. So I found a place to sit, kind of a seating area like what we have going outside there. I found a seating area that is like, kind of like in the way, on purpose, because I was actually anxious to ask somebody, hey, do you know Noni? That's her name. I said, do you know her? And I'm waiting to have somebody come along. I'm sitting by myself. I turn sideways to look at people as they're going by, and not one person said anything to me. Have you been in a church that way? Well, a place, any place open for the public where they, you walk in and they don't care that you're there. A growing church is a church that has a high love quotient that they're anxious to talk to people when they come in. And I'm not kidding. Is that not like here? You have to barge through. You literally want to say, Red Rover, Red Rover, can I come over? because they're going to lock arms, and you're not getting through. Not getting through. you got to barge through. Do you guys remember that? Any of the young ones know what Red Rover, Red Rover is? Okay, do you guys? Oh, youth activity. You know it? Are you allowed to play it? Okay, she's going to help lead it. 
and you don't end playing until someone gets hurt. That's like just the rule. Somebody is going to get hurt, these young people today. How are they not doing this fun stuff? Man, that was fun. Go for the weak link, the girl, the little girl, and just plow through her, and you're a hero for it. Like, you actually commended for breaking through her. Well, that's what it is here. You have to get through the people, the friendliness that you are to people. If you have First John, there's going to be an, actually an easy idea that I have for us today. John, just John 15. John 15, there's a movement here, and the title of the sermon is Love 1, 2, 3, because I want us to think 1, 2, 3. And you'll see it, I think, clearly in the text on loving one another. Take a look at verse 9. And if you see in your notes, it's the purest of love. It's John 15, 9. And you see I have the letter A. That means the only the first phrase of the verse. This is Jesus speaking, and he says, As the Father has loved me. I'm just going to shoot straight the one, two, three right off the bat. Jesus said, as the Father loved me, that's one. The next phrase, so I love you. So God, just as God loves Jesus, Jesus loves us. And then if you look down to verse 12, this is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. He's literally linking this for us. We're not reading into the text even a little bit. It literally says, as the Father loved me, I love you. And as I love you, my commandment is that you love one another. It's one, two, three. Think about this for a minute. We've got to start at the top. As God loved Jesus, how would you describe that? This is, we're talking about the purest of love. We're now in a laboratory, and we have created the purest of love as the Father loves Jesus. How does the Father love Jesus? If you were to come up with a few adjectives, some descriptors of what must that love be like from the Father to the Son… What would those descriptives be? Let me hear some. Just what would you say would be likely the love represented from God the Father to the Son? What would it be? Unconditional. Unconditional. Really? Same? Is, is, and isn't that alone just the deepest of things? If there is a word to describe our love that we have for each other, it would probably be conditional. So, unconditional. An adoration. adoration. Yell out a few more. Don't let them win. <laughs> Everlasting. Never ending. Never-ending. Ooh, non judgmental. Yeah, you guys do this to me now and then that if I ever teach this again, I want to take all your ideas and teach them as they were mine. So, um, of anyone in the world to be without a pen, it's the guy who collects pens. Oh, really, Joyce? Did you have an answer? To, oh, even that one. Yeah. Oh, I'll get it back to you. Did you answer the question, though? Did you, was there a way? How would you describe the love that God the Father has for the Son. How would you describe it? Never-ending. Okay, you like that one? Never-ending? Somebody else? Patient. Patient. Never-ending. What was the one you guys shared? Unconditional. Unconditional. Okay. Anyone else have one that we've missed? Pure. I like that. That's a good one. Ooh, sacrificial. What was that? Perfect. 
Okay, you see what, see what we're doing? This is so good because it has to be one, two, three. If we go to three too quick, it's already bogged down. It's like old oil you've never changed. It's got too much mixed in. We want right here, in fact, pure was a great one, perfect. We want to, we got to start here at the, at the beginning because that was where it starts. Just as the Father loved me, so I love you. As God the Father loves the Son, non-judgmental, perfect, patient, never-ending, pure, sacrificial, like that. Because God's love for Jesus, listen to this, because of God's love for Jesus, nothing could touch, look wrong, scheme against, violate, abandon, bring about lonely, redirect. Nothing can touch Jesus except that which the Father has specifically allowed because I love him that much. He's off limits. Don't do that to him unless I say you could do that to him. Everything that happened to Jesus was allowed within the will of the Father. Acts, in the book of Acts, I think it's chapter 2, specifically says they, they crucified him by the direct will and plan of the Father. They didn't touch him, except that he said, you can touch him. And because he did, it's because we, then we know that it was what was best for Jesus and best for God's will, both. Think about your own life now. It's kind of the message that we'll have on the 26th with Grant. Are you waiting for something to happen for you to have joy? If only. If God could make that go away, I'll be okay. Really? So you can't be okay right now. So you're okay based on circumstances. You're okay because of health or family or relationships. Well, Jesus had everything torn away from him. Just as the Father loves the Son, and then he says, so I have loved you. I've loved you the same way. It's the second point. It's in your notes. I just wrote, ah, soak it in. So I have loved you. Okay, want to know how Jesus loves you? You guys already said it. You said it for me. You did my research. Patiently, never-ending, unconditionally, purely, sacrificially, perfectly. That's how Jesus loves you. You can't do anything to eliminate his love. And you've tried, <laughs> right? Haven't we? I mean, we've done a fair amount of offensive things to him. And he still loves us. Why? Because it's unconditional. Nothing. So when you and I sin and we don't spend much time in the Bible or Bible reading for a while, we're just like, eh, I'm too busy. And we're getting caught up in things and we go back to him. And we're always like, hey, it's me. Sorry. Because <laughs> we're expecting him to go, oh, really? You're back. <laughs> oh, really? Nice to have you back. Been busy, huh? Yeah, I'm sorry about that. His love is unconditional. His love is unconditional. 
You've never earned it. You and I were never okay with God because we were living a perfect life. We are okay with God because of Jesus Christ. That's never changed. We're still accepted and loved by him because of Jesus, not because of anything that we've done. So when we're in sin and we drift away and we've not opened our Bible in a long time, can't find it, and we're just kind of living our own life and we finally go, I'm going to go back. And we open our Bible and we go, hey. He goes, hey. It's good to see you. I love you. Yeah, I've been gone. I know, but you're back now. (laughs) Here you are. I love you. That's unconditional, never-ending. We all said those things. Patient, just, just the same way that the Father loves the Son, one, the Son loves us. He loves us the same way. This is the phrase. So in your Bible, if you have it open there, it's verse 9. It says, as the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. So here's some other translations of it. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. New American Standard. Just as the Father has loved me, I have also loved you. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. (laughs) They're all the same. I mean, it's that simple. The text is that simple. You know, you read like six translations and how different they can sometimes be because there's some tricky words in there that we don't have those words in the English, and so they're having to kind of figure it out, and they're the same thing, but they're saying it in a different way. This is so clear. It's so simple. Just as the Father loves the Son, pause, how is that? And we think through that love in that same way the Son loves us. Because of Jesus' love, nothing can touch you, nothing can wrong you, scheme against you, violate you, abandon you. Nothing can redirect you. Nothing can happen except that the Son has allowed it because the Father has allowed it to happen in your life. I don't know why. In fact, I hate it too. There are parts of your life that I will, with you, lead the charge to make it go away. I hate it also. But it's there. And I don't know why he did it. But I know that in the same way that the Father loves the Son, the Son loves us. The worst event in the history of the world was the crucifixion of Jesus. Undeserved, he was perfect, public humiliation. That was a Friday. On Saturday, the followers kind of hid and they were distraught. And they, on that Saturday, couldn't even dream of anything good that could have come out of Friday. It's so bad. There's nothing good that can come out of that. Literally, the wheels fell off. On three years of traveling with Jesus, we had it so, we were kicked out of some of the greatest towns. But we kept going, and we saw healing. And last night ruined ever. It is a horrible ending to a story. You realize that was Saturday. They were less than a day away from finding out that it was the greatest thing that's ever happened in the world. And they didn't see it. They had no idea. The next day, Jesus comes out of the tomb, and they're like, Oh, you conquered death. 
I never saw, oh, this is the, the history of the world. The greatest success was the resurrection of Jesus Christ, of all sin, all taken care of through belief in him only, happened, and they were less than a day away and they didn't see it. I don't know why that happened to you in your life. In fact, I'm going to go on record as a Saturday person, and I'm going to say it. I can't even dream of a reason why that should have happened to you. I I hate it. Zero good out of it. I, I am so sorry. It may be something that no one even knows happened to you. It may be something that we all know that happened to you. But we all, do we not all have something that is so dreadful in our past, so painful to us, even right now by me saying it, you're wishing I'm just going to keep going and get out of this. But I'm going to tell you, I cannot think of a good reason for it. But I'm saying based on the authority of God's Word in the very same way that the Father loves the Son and allows things to happen that was for the best. The Son loves us. And I may never know what it is, and you may never know till we get to see him someday. And I have no idea if it's going to be the first thing you ask. I don't know. We're, we're going to be changed up there. But I know that eventually we're going to say, hey, by the way, that was horrible. Literally don't wish it on my enemies. But now I get it. And he throws his arms out and says, I knew you would, and I'm so sorry that I had to do that to you. But you see it now, don't you? I do. I know that's true. In the same way that God the Father loves the Son, the Son loves us. But there is a number three. And the number three is down in verse 12. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. This is hard. We're offending each other all the time. We say, don't know that we said it. We know we said it. It's hurtful in your past. There's things that people have done. It's it's constant. What do we do? Well, the love that we have for one another needs to be patient, never-ending, unconditional, pure, sacrificial, and perfect. And I didn't come up with that list. (laughs) That wasn't my list. That was your list. And I'm challenged by it. There's three totally different deep subjects here. The first one is how the first person of the Trinity loves the second person of the Trinity. But that becomes the template. That love is the template. That pure, you gave gave those, you you ran around the subject so perfectly. That pure love, unconditional, never end love that the Father to the Son is a subject we could write about and talk about forever. But that same love from the second person of the Trinity goes to you. Whole different subject. I need it. I need it every day. And that love needs to go through me to people around me. It's one, two, three. And I can't do it. I can't do it. I'm not capable of doing it. I'm too insecure to do it. I'm too broken to do it. So what we have to do is keep going back to the source 
as we are filled with that love that's the Father to the Son to us, as we're filled with that love, it's like filling a big bucket. As I'm filled daily with that love, because it doesn't last. It's not like I fill it once a week. As I am being filled with his love through prayer and time with him and Bible reading and just sitting under this fountain of refreshing love, am I able to turn it and dip it and pour it into the lives of other people? I can't do that. It's not in me to do it. Mine's empty. So I can read about the Bible and study it, but studying it in academic isn't it. Just me saying it isn't enough. We can't just do it. It's going back to one. I need to understand and study between the Father to the Son. And then I need to soak in and live as the Son comes to us. And then I need to keep learning and practicing and change to allow it to flow through me into the lives of people around me. Regardless of how they hurt us, regardless of their different opinion, regardless of their different theology, regardless of their different worldview, we are to love others. There's an amazing um, quote. I just, I love this. It's from the 1800s. He's Danish. He said, however ridiculous, however awkward, however expedient, loving one another may seem, it is still the highest a person is capable of doing. This isn't a fringe talk topic. However awkward as it might be, however ridiculous as it may seem, loving others is what we're called to do. It is the love of God to the Father, God the Father to the Son. It is His love to us that we are called to love a world around us. Let me end with this. You may know this. Anna Jarvis, she is the one who um, started Mother's Day in America, and it was south of us here. It was down about an hour and 15 minutes into West Virginia, Grafton. Do you guys ever been to Grafton, West Virginia? Kind of vacation spot, I'm assuming. Yeah. Yeah, there's a Grafton, Ohio also, and I've just have a tough time not thinking that they might be very similar. But at a memorial service, uh, Anna Jarvis on May 10th, 1908, Miss Jarvis gave a carnation to each of the people at the memorial service in tribute to mom's love. Isn't that sweet? That's probably kind of how it kind of continues that way. That's why there's flowers up here, and that's why uh, ladies, as you leave today, you are able to receive a flower on your way out. It's not even so much flowers for the moms. It was flowers to celebrate moms. And so it was given to everybody. But it's all about love. It was about mom's love. Of course it is. That's who changes our lives, are the love. And my encouragement for all of us that we would maybe look into and study more of God's love to the Son, that we would definitely experience more of Jesus' love to us, and then that maybe we would practice more of our love to others. But you've got to keep that flow going through. So let's bow in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for the time we've spent together. As you have loved Jesus, Jesus loves us. And then, Father, in your word, as a commandment that you've told us to love one another, pray that you would lead us to that end. In Jesus' name, amen.